Welcome to you all today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Ben Saunders, professor of English and comics and cartoon studies at the University of Oregon. He's the author of Desiring Done and Do the Gods Wear Capes, Spirituality, Fantasy, and Superheroes. Saunders curated Aliens, Monsters, and Mad Men, The Art of EC Comics, currently on view at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art through July 10th, 2016. Thanks, Ben, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. The first question, I think, is the most important question. What is or was EC Comics, and why does it merit an, an exhibit in an art museum? Ah, well, um, so EC Comics, uh, was the most politically uh, daring and aesthetically radical comic book company of the 1950s and perhaps by extension one of the most interesting and adventurous comic book companies uh, of the whole of the 20th century. Um, so uh, they were most active between the late 40s and the mid 50s and um, they specialized in genre, popular genre materials. They did not have continuing characters that appeared from month to month, no superheroes or anything like that. Um, they did these anthology books of crime, horror, science fiction, war, and then they had this humor parody title that a lot of people have heard of called Mad. And why does it merit an exhibit in an art museum? Uh, it, well, it was a turning point in the history of the medium. It was a turning point actually in the history of American popular culture that they participated in. Um, at the time, comics were perceived by most people as being a children's medium primarily. And most comics were what you might just think of as dumb fun. Um, but there, there were uh, certain people within the, the industry and within the medium um, who felt that this was an art form, uh, that this was an art form, let's just put it like that, um, and that there was uh, potential here to do more than had really already been done in terms of American comics, in terms of the, t the kinds of stories that could be told and also the way that they could be told, the, uh, the degree of... Um, formal difficulty that readers could tolerate as well as the kind of maturity of the content. Um, and EC really were at the vanguard of this, I think almost accidentally, they were always a commercially oriented company. They, I don't think that the publisher Bill Gaines woke up one morning and said, I am going to make people recognize comics as an art form. Um, but he did a whole set of things that other publishers didn't do and that we tend to associate more with the arts. He encouraged artists to draw in their own styles instead of drawing in a house style. Um, he encouraged artists to sign their work, um, which no other publisher did. I mean, if you drew comics for Disney, it was probably the biggest selling comic book publisher of the early 50s. It's Disney's name on it, on everything. Uh, Gaines allowed the artists to sign their work and encouraged people to write in. They had letter pages where they fostered a kind of early fandom something that was picked up by Stan Lee later in the 1960s, but really this all modern fandom begins at EC in the early 50s. Um, and uh, he kept books alive when they weren't selling terribly well because he believed in the work of the creators. The key example here would be Harvey Kurtzman, his war comics and the later the early issues of Mad, um, which didn't sell terribly well and were not coming out consistently on time because of the way that Kurtzman worked. And um, in the traditional comic book industry, both of those things would be the kiss of death. The publisher would just pull the plug. You're not selling and you're not getting the book out on time, you're, you're done. And that wasn't Gaines's attitude. Uh, he allowed the, so he had almost a kind of a patron of the arts approach in some ways, even though he was a commercial publisher. How did he find these artists? Where did he come upon them? Well, he offered some of the best rates in the industry. Um, and when artists, I think, realized that how much creative freedom they were being given at EC, um, they came to him. So um, you, you mentioned the genres, and my understanding is that particular artists focused on particular genres. Yeah, that's right. And uh, why was that the case? Well, in some cases, it was um, a, a happy coincidence of material and style. So, for example, with an artist like Graham Ingalls, who's in many ways more of an illustrator than a sequential artist, the way that, that the EC production method worked suited his approach to horror very well. Um, Al Feldstein would write the stories and then actually have the boards lettered 
uh, before they went to the artist, and then the artist would draw uh, around or on these pre-lettered boards. Nobody else ever worked this way. Um, but for an artist who thinks more like an illustrator, so essentially what you're doing is kind of illustrated text, which is what Ingalls really was, it worked very well and it allowed him to um, labor and work um, without thinking about sequence terribly much on these uh, horrific stories which he loved to do. He would sort of get lost in the almost Hieronymus Bosch-like production of Beasties. Um, we've got some nice examples of that in, in the show. Um, after actually um, EC were, uh, ended up having to um, cease publication in the mid-50s by and large, Ingalls couldn't work anywhere else. He was so suited to horror, there were, when horror comics were banned, there was nothing else for him to do. Um, in the case of other artists, uh, Kurtzman, um, again, who I've already mentioned, he's really, um, his style is that of a humorist. He never drew a straight line if he could do a curve. Um, his characters are, have that boneless, bendy quality that um, iconic cartoon characters have. Um, but his early work was this war material, um, which is very serious. So there's this actually extraordinary contrast between um, the abstract, uh, rounded um, uh, humor orientation of his visual style and the very grim, often very well-researched, uh, anti-jingoistic, anti-propagandist war comics that he was doing. It produces almost a cognitive dissonance between the content of the material and the style of the work. Uh, and, and so that was a very uh, happy accident again, really. And then, of course, you have the science fiction guys and the, the crime guys. They all would try their hands at other kinds of things, but they tended to, to Wally Wood and Al Williamson clearly excelled um, in the science fiction genre and ended up, I actually think, shaping our sense of what, let's say, the interior of a spaceship is supposed to look like. Uh, Wood's work um, was a big influence on George Lucas. And I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that he was giving his set designers when he made Star Wars Wally Wood and Al Williamson comics to look at. And that kind of lived spaceship, futuristic, but lived in look. The look of the interior of the Millennium Falcon where you really might think, okay, this is a spaceship, but it also looks like maybe a Wookiee and a smuggler live here. <laughs> um, this is what uh, the kinds of things that Wood was doing with these incredibly detailed um, spaceship interiors which somehow still have a kind of a functionality to them. So they, they work in these popular genres, and these are popular genres that are, uh, as genres, they're not what you would call high genres. No. So crime, sci-fi, horror. Mm -hmm. The company starts out under Gaines' father, Max Gaines, as uh, educational comics, yes. and they're doing stories about science history and the Bible. Yes. When Bill takes over, he goes to these popular genres. But the way that his artists did these popular genres, and you've already alluded to it, these stories were not just dumb genre stories. No. So what was special about the narratives themselves, despite the popular genres that they were in? Well, um, it's, it, that's an excellent question, because I suppose, in a way, um, one could argue that the perception of those genres as being um, low cultural, you know, there's this sort of slice of life literature, there's poetry, and, and then, you know, down somewhere lower on the, the cultural totem pole, there's science fiction. Um, I think um, it's around about this time in the 1950s that a certain uh, a cohort of science fiction writers are themselves pushing against that perception of what they do. Nowadays, I don't think there would be um, any difficulty on the part of most people of thinking of science fiction as an entirely legitimate, you would call it speculative fiction now, and it's, it's a legitimate literary genre. Um, so I think in a way, um, what EC, as a publisher, what Bill Gaines as a publisher is trying to do for the, the comics form as a whole, there's some similar things going on with people who are working in these popular genres. Uh, the same might be said of detective fiction, the work of Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett um, in between the 30s and the 50s also is pushing at the frontiers of, what, uh, of, the, of those genres and in some ways producing a kind of bleak poetry of violence. Um, and elevating the genre stylistically, even as they are producing this, what would be seen as uh, not elevated content. 
Um, so I think the comics are participating in a, a larger movement um, where uh, American popular genres um, are starting to be recognized as um, legitimate modes of storytelling in themselves. The crossover with the science fiction stuff is pretty direct in that um, Gaines and Feldstein were just stealing um, a lot of their basic story ideas and then changing them up a bit for the comics format. And at one point they stole a couple of ideas from Ray Bradbury, who would now be considered, I think, one of the great American short story writers of the 20th century in any genre, in any medium. But at the time, Bradbury is a, a pulpy writer, uh, regarded as a pulp writer. So uh, they stole a couple of ideas from him. He noticed because he read comics and liked them. And he wrote to them and said, uh, really love the adaptation, but something's gone wrong because I didn't get my check. And uh, they wrote back saying, you know, oh, so glad you got in touch. We didn't know how to reach you. Uh, and they um, initiated uh, a, um, a relationship with him where they started to ad adapt his work officially, do these legitimate ad adaptations of Bradbury stories, and then put his name very prominently on the cover. So they adapted, I think, 22 Bradbury stories, all told. He wrote crime stories in those days as well, so crime and um, science fiction stories which means that they had some of the most literate comics on the stands in the period because they were taking work directly from the pages of this master of the short story form. You mentioned that uh, some of these were the most literate. You've also alluded earlier when talking about Kurtzman's war uh, writing um, that it was not patriotic, it was not heroizing. Some of the stuff they were doing is like among the most politically progressive uh, popular culture that's being produced at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking in particular of the most famous example, which I'd like you to say a little bit about Judgment Day. Sure. Tell us about that comment. So Judgment Day is um, a anti-racist allegory disguised as a science fiction story. Um, the story is about a, uh, an astronaut who arrives on a planet populated by robots and uh, the judgment day of the title is that he's there to judge whether their planet is worthy to be welcomed into uh, the intergalactic federation. So he's there to observe the planet and their customs and so on. And the planet the, of robots is divided into two kinds. There are orange robots and blue robots. And one of the things that this astronaut discovers, and by the way, for the entire a strip up until the very end, you never see the astronaut's face. He has a helmet the whole time, so he's walking around with this spacesuit on. He discovers that they treat the blue robots differently to the way they treat the orange robots, but there's no difference apart from the color of their casings. Um, and there are some obvious references to uh, the political culture of the United States at the time. There's a scene, for example, where he gets onto a bus and moves towards the back and his orange robot host says, oh no, 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 only the blue robots sit at the back of the bus, you sit at the front, um, which is obviously a reference to the uh, segregation of public transport in the American South during, the, uh, during this period. Um, although the story was actually initially published um, three years before the Montgomery bus boycott, three years before Rosa Parks' famous protest, um, they were drawing attention to, to this in this comic. Um, so anyway, the, the astronaut observes the planet and is disappointed and has to tell his uh, robot host that they're not ready to be um, brought into the Intergalactic Federation, that they need to do a bit of thinking. Um, and, uh, uh, but there is hope for them, he says. It was like this for mankind and then we figured out how to live together and then the universe was ours. And then he gets onto his spaceship to fly away and in the last panel he removes his helmet and you see that he has the phenotypical features of a black man. So um, this was uh, startling for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, the anti-racist um, allegory is a powerful one, um, but representations of people of color, and particularly African Americans in American comics, um, it's a pretty sad story up in, right up into the 1950s in terms of um, how African Americans are visually represented in most mainstream American comics, the uh, kind of um, Sambo figure and the minstrel show imagery is um, the dominant visual mode. So even a really accomplished um, and significant American artist like, say, Will Eisner, 
the man who gave his names to the comics Oscars, the Eisner Awards. Eisner's work in the 40s and 50s, he has a, this, uh, on a strip called The Spirit, there's an a, a African-American sidekick character for the, the spirit named Ebony, who is rendered in ways that are um, just painful to look at today. Uh, I know that Eisner himself was profoundly embarrassed and ashamed by that, of that work, of, the, of, of that representation of Ebony um, decades later. But uh, so what EC were doing simply in rendering people of color as human beings was startling. It's um, shocking and depressing to realize what a, um, what a, that seems like a very low hurdle to have cleared to us. Um, but in the US in 1952, it, it was a very big deal indeed. So EC is doing this um, subversive, progressive uh, storytelling in the early 1950s. And as they're doing this work, treating these artists in ways that they've never been treated before, there's a backlash against comics sure. happening in the United States. Why is that happening? What's going on there? Uh, it's, it's a really good question because there's, there's, not, uh, there's probably multiple reasons for any kind of moral panic. Um, and there's a measure of sort of mob think going on in the culture generally um, that's being exploited by demagogic politicians like McCarthy. Um, we're talking about the height of the Cold War. We're talking about um, the Red Scare. We're talking about um, the rumblings of the first rumblings of the civil rights movement. Um, and uh, we're talking about a lot of um, less fully articulated, I think, but um, a real backlash against women's rights in the wake of um, World War II and the kinds of uh, opportunities that women had enjoyed during the war. So the 1950s is in many ways a sort of a, um, and from an ideological point of view, there's sort of a containment exercise going on, all of this stuff that is going to, um, of course, explode in the 1960s. Um, and we'll see all of these things, you know, coming to the surface in sometimes violent ways. So uh, comics, I think, were, the hysteria against comics was part of that um, general undercurrent of fear and uh, ideological groupthink. Um, and politicians and journalists um, have always known how to exploit these kinds of fears. And uh, headlines are a good thing um, from the point of view of a politician or a journalist. And comics were a relatively easy target. I think that it was it was certainly easier to to say the reason that we've you know we have juvenile delinquency now is you know um, not because of the repressive nature of the culture in which we live or the, the you know the, the disasters of post-war capitalism, but because kids are reading this inappropriate fantasy material. You know, attacks on um, rap lyrics in the 1980s of the kind that were you know people like. Joe Lieberman were, were involved with, or um, attacks on video games in the, the 90s or even today. Um, these are, uh, it's the same rhetoric, it's the same kind of fear mongering. Um, and at this particular moment, all that was really needed was, a, was um, a credentialed and qualified individual to come along and serve as the lightning rod for the anti comics movement. And uh, they got that in the shape of a guy named Frederick Wortham. Uh, who is a, um, uh, almost a cartoon psychiatrist. He has this uh, um, sort of clipped uh, Austrian accent. Um, and uh, he said, you know, and he had a PhD and, and he ran a, a clinic and uh, he insisted that all of these kids that were brought to him with social problems, um, well, they all read comic books. So obviously there was a connection. And he went on TV and he published uh, articles in magazines. And in the end, he published a book with the um, sensationalistic title, Seduction of the Innocent, as good as any EC title when you think about <laughs> it. Um, and, uh, and it worked, you know. He, he got a, a lot of um, notoriety out of it. And um, uh, he galvanized this, this movement. And there was uh, uh, the comics industry took a lot of heat, uh, EC in particular. What happens to EC at that point? Well, um, they tried to fight it in various ways. They didn't go under immediately. Bill Gaines um, first attempted to organize publishers against um, this uh, sort of censorship move, but the publishers themselves turned against him because 
the thing you have to bear in mind, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about this being kind of a turning point in, in the artistic perception of comics. Uh, the big money in comics was not necessarily in what DC were doing. The big money was in um, Disney um, uh, comics or Archie. Archie was one of the top selling titles of the period. And that stuff was seen as relatively wholesome. And the publishers who produced that material, um, they, they didn't, they weren't, they didn't see the need for, to protect Bill Gaines and the right to do more mature stories. As far as they were concerned, all companies like EC were doing was drawing down a lot of heat on them, and they were producing this material that no parent was that concerned about. So in the publishers, in a rather cowardly move, but a commercially canny one, united against Gaines and a handful of other um, horror and crime publishers, and banned the words crime, horror, terror, and weird. And this is how we know EC is being targeted. They banned the word weird from the titles of comics. So Gaines first had to re reissue all of his comics with um, different titles. Otherwise, they wouldn't get distribution. That was the punishment. Um, your stuff just wouldn't get in, the, the comics just wouldn't get into the stores and the newsstands. Um, so he tried a new line um, in attempting to avoid the code, but the brand at this point was kind of contaminated, so then he tried going through the code, then he tried doing um, illustrated pictofiction, as he called them, magazines. Uh, none of that stuff worked. The only thing that survived in the end was Mad, which survived, which survived by becoming a magazine. And if you were a magazine, you avoided this comics code authority that had been set up. You avoided the censorship body, essentially, because they charge a bit more for it, and you, it gets racked somewhere else in the newsstand. Um, and Mad was an enormous hit, of course, uh, and was read by future countercultural types like Ken Kesey, but it was also read by um, uh, pretty high-positioned people at the time, tastemakers of the time. Steve Allen was a big mad fan. Hugh Hefner was a big mad fan. And um, uh, these, uh, uh, everyone in television, according to um, Kurtzman, seems to have been reading mad uh, in between 1952 and 1955. It was one of the few other pieces of pop culture that was as hip and as new as the best TV. And it was at the same time satirizing TV, um, and satirizing commercial culture. Uh, satirizing commercial culture from within commercial culture. So Mad was an enormous sex success, obviously, and went on to become the, the one thing, um, the one EC title that actually is still in print today. But everything else disappeared in 1956. So given this legacy, which you've told us many things about, um, what were the challenges of curating this exhibit? How did you get these stories? Why could you get them? Um, yeah, okay, so the, we most, this is another of the ways in which Bill Gaines was a distinctive publisher in that he kept the art. So this stuff exists because um, Gaines warehoused it, um, at, uh, cons paid the storage costs. At the time, uh, original comic book art, the production art was not considered, it had no value once the comics had come out, and um, most publishers destroyed it. At DC Comics, it was destroyed. At Marvel and Timely, it was destroyed. Um, so uh, all of this comics material from the 1950s, uh, very hard to find original examples of, of original art. Gaines is this glorious exception in that he kept it all, and uh, sold it off in complete story lots in the early 1980s, and then gave a percentage of the proceeds of those sales to the, the artists, which he didn't have to do. He owned, he owned the art outright. Um, and that meant that the, the work went out in complete story batches to hardcore fans um, back in the 80s. And then I, through the magic of the internet as much as anything else, I, I, I just tried to start tracking things down. There were certain pieces that we couldn't get hold of. Um, the cover of, the original cover for Mad Number no. 1 is apparently in the collection of Steven Spielberg, for example, and um, Mr. Spielberg was unwilling to lend. Um, but we do have the covers of two, three, and four, and the original color, watercolor study um, that Kurtzman made for the cover of number one, all on one wall. I think that I don't think I think that's unprecedented, actually, um, and a real slice of Americana in in or in one place for people to see. Um, so that's how we are able to do it at all. Uh, Gaines preserved the art, and it was a question of tracking down individual lenders. Of course, no 
institution. No um, uh, uh, art museum in this country invested in any serious way in comic book art in the 20th century. So it is all in the hands of private collectors. And that means that um, I have to appeal in the end to the goodwill and the generosity of those people who are willing to lend. And um, we were really fortunate uh, in a couple of our lenders, uh, in all, with all of our lenders, we ended up I think with six individuals who were willing to lend, um, all of whom had extraordinary pieces and pretty much from the beginning were willing to let us borrow whatever we wanted. So we have a couple of minutes left. This is probably the last question. You've just alluded to your collectors. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about some of the um, other associated events with the show that you've organized. Oh, okay. So we've we had a collectors panel um, after the opening where people got to talk about their sort of what EC meant to them and where their own passion for the material came from. Professor Kiana Whitted of the University of South Carolina came and gave an excellent talk uh, just last week on um, representations of race in EC comics. Um, uh, Chris Pazino of the University of Georgia at Athens is going to come and talk about Frederick Wortham, that um, dubious psychologist I mentioned earlier. Um, Mark Arnold, who's a, a local comics historian and a, a history of humor comics um, historian, he's going to come and talk about um, Harvey Kurtzman's Mad. Um, and I'll be giving a couple of gallery tours myself. Uh, all of that stuff you can see if you go to the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art website, there is a link to all of the related programming for the show if people want to come. So we have once one minute left. I'm going to ask you the last question. We're, we're in front of this wall of MAD. Yes. There's something important about this wall. Tell yes. us what it is. This is all work by Basil Wolverton, um, who, is, uh, who was born in Oregon and I believe is the only Oregon-born artist in, in the show. Uh, and uh, His stuff is truly incredible, uh, a kind of uh, uh, vivid rendering that um, uh, is just mind-blowingly detailed, and the way he draws is creepier than what he draws. Well, on that note, let me thank you again for talking to us, and thanks for all the effort that you put into you. Uh, putting the show together. It's been a pleasure. I've been speaking with Ben Saunders, professor of English and Comics and Cartoon Studies at the University of Oregon. He curated Aliens, Monsters, and Mad Men, The Art of EC Comics. The exhibit is on view at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art through July 10th, 2016. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.